In this module, we will be looking at the x86 hardware side. Things like the CPU cores, processor caching, uh, memory access, non-uniform memory access within a system, hyper-threading, how peripheral devices get connected through a PCIe bus, and in general, how it comes together as a system. For examples, we will be looking at a real Intel processor and a real system where the Intel processor fits in. So have fun with this module. So let us look at a real processor and specifically to the processor caches and memory and how do instructions get loaded into the processor? How does it get its data? And for that purpose, what I have done is I've taken uh, for purposes of working through a real data set, I have looked at a real processor, the Intel Xeon 8180. It has 28 cores and operates at a 2.5 gigahertz processor speed. So 2.5 gigahertz means you have 2.5 billion clock cycles per second, which translates to 2.5 clock cycles every nanoseconds. So the, every nanosecond, the processor is able to go through 2.5 clock cycles. Every clock cycle will partially complete a, an instruction. So how do the instructions get their data? Processors that are modern use, they get memory of course from the RAM, but then they optimize how they get memory by having built-in caches. So modern processors have three layers of caching that is built in within the CPU. Level one, level two, level three. Now this does not have to be definite, but the processor we are looking at does have these caches. So the Intel 8180 has a level one. Now level one caching is separated by the instruction cache and the data cache. And this helps keeps the instruction cache from keeping the instruction cache set and not get wiped out because of the data and keeps the data separately. The L1 cache is the smallest cache in size. So it's only 32 kilobyte. And for the instruction set and the second 32 kilobyte for the data set caching. This L1 cache is also the fastest cache around. It takes about four to five clock cycles. And these are written in the specs to get data from the L1 cache uh, moved in. Uh, four to five clock cycles, given that 2.5 clock cycles per nanosecond. So you're looking at two, 2.5 nanoseconds to get data from the L1 cache. This cache is part of the core. So every core has its own L1 caches. And in the Intel processor we are looking at, in the physical processor CPU, there are 28 cores within that. So every each one of these 28 cores has an L1 cache. And if you want to find the total amount of L1 cache, it is 28 times 32 plus 32. So 28 times 64 kilobyte. Uh, but each core only controls its cache. The L2 cache is also a cache that is at a core level. The L2 cache is farther away from the L1 cache. So you, you don't have a data set in the L1 cache. You'll drop to the L2 cache to find it. The L2 cache takes longer to move the data in. So it's about 14 clock cycle latency to get data from the L2 cache, about you know, a few single digit nanoseconds to get data from the L2 cache. The L2 cache is bigger in size and it is a combined cache for instruction and data. There is no separation now, but it is separate, separated for each, each core within the physical CPU. After the L2 cache, there is the L3 cache. Now, the L3 cache is at the CPU level combined across all cores. So before you hit the RAM, you will check for is the data in the L3 cache. L3 cache is also larger in size because it also caters to all, this, all the cores data. It also takes longer in time. So L3 cache, 50 to 70 clock cycle latency. Now these numbers vary if you look at the data set, but they're generally in the 40, 50, 60, 70 clock cycle latency range, which means about 25 nanoseconds, you will get the data if you are to get the data from the L3 cache. The L3 cache is 38.5 megabytes and it is shared across all the cores. In this case, it means there is 38.5 megabytes to be shared across the 28 cores in this particular processor. Once the data is not in the cache, in the L3 cache, the data will be retrieved from the RAM. The RAM is farther out and the RAM now takes 
longer than the L3 cache. So the RAM latency will now be about 60 to 100 nanoseconds to get data from the RAM back to the CPU. Now the reason this is important is because if constantly processes are just churning over data and you're always getting data from the RAM, you're not optimizing the CPU's ability to operate faster. Or if your program was getting data and was able to move and uh, bring data to the cache and optimize and run data from the caches, it's going to be much faster than always trying to get data from the RAM. So when we get to process context switching, these these things become important. The other thing that is interesting is how in the modern processors the memory is structured. So we have one CPU socket but on servers you also have more than one CPU socket. So you can have servers with two CPU sockets, three CPU sockets, four CPU sockets, even bigger ones. Non-uniform memory access is the way these modern systems are built. Memory is still connected in the bus to a single CPU socket. So see if, if we take this example where we have four CPUs, each of those four CPUs will have their own memory modules rather than in the system sharing all the memory modules across all the four CPUs. So CPU one will be directly connected to the memory module one, CPU two to memory module two, CPU 3 to memory module 3 and CPU 4 to memory module 4. So then the question becomes, how does CPU 1 get access to data in memory module 3? The way it works is there is a CPU interconnect and CPU 1 will go through and in the case of Intel, they have the ultra path interconnect in the, in the 8180. And so you will go through this interconnect, which is a high speed interconnect between the two CPUs, but you have, but CPU one has to go to CPU three to get data in memory module three. So CPU three will serve back to CPU one, the data in memory module three. What does this mean to programming and to how, you sh how we should use these systems? So the fastest way for a CPU to get memory is to get memory from the memory that's directly linked to it. The second way would be to go to memories that are in other CPUs. So the performance goal would be that if you have processes running, that they better be, that more processes that need to share memory, they all be running on the same CPU. And same CPU means processes, threads, but all, uh, all threads of the same kind of processes that need to get to the same memory be on the same CPU, physical CPU. And then they could be divided between the cores because the cores still have access to the same memory module. And, and VMs that get mapped, they are mapped this way only when you have larger uh, bare metals and they get subdivided into VMs. So VMs get mapped to CPUs uh, for their cores and then CPUs are connected to one memory module. And I ran a instruction, so how do you know which NUMA node are you using? So you can do a cat in, in Linux and then slash prox slash and if you have a process you put the process ID number and then go to NUMA maps and then you get all the NUMA maps there. So you will have instructions data sets like n0 equals something n0 equals and the letter after the n is indicates the NUMA module number, NUMA module number that you are using. In the above example I, I can see that the module number that I'm using is zero and it's always zero in this process. So all process threads, it's all you know linked to module zero uh, in this case. So we, we went through NUMA. Another interesting thing in modern CPUs is hyper-threading. So you will find the concept of we have a CPU and Intel and this particular CPU has 28 cores but it can run 56 threads. So what does that mean? It means that every core can run two threads. Now two threads means in the core, there is still a single execution engine. So every core still has one execution engine. But what has happened is they've doubled all the registers. So registers store the state of a program and you make, and in hyper-threading, 
you give each thread its own register so that the state of the program is preserved uh, and the execution engine will flip between thread 1 and thread 2 and when it goes to thread 1 it will use register set 1 data and when it goes to thread 2 it will use register set 2 data. How does this help? Well it helps because the execution engine may not be always doing something. It could be waiting on data movement in and so when all that context switching is happening then the, the engine can still work on the second thread's data. Now this is not necessary if you don't want to use it. In fact if there is something that is very compute heavy for a single thread then you might think well how do two, two threads ever benefit? Uh, and, and in those cases it may not make a whole lot of sense but a lot of other programming needs hyper threading makes sense because you're waiting and you may as you may as well do something useful with that waiting time uh, without having to context switch so that's what hyper threading uh, does it's still a single core single execution engine but two set of registers and two set of states for two threads Let's now look at how the CPU gets built up into a system. So I took a real system example here, the UCS C220M5, and you can go and look at the data in the spec sheet, uh, the data specific or the specification in the in the URL I have written here. So there are two CPUs that you could put here, two sockets. Each CPU is the same Intel CPU 8180 that we are using here in this case although you could use different CPUs to build the system so you will have L1, L2, L3 cache 28 cores that you bought in that CPU two CPUs are connected to each other on the U uh, ultra path interconnect and then they are connected to memory here so how does the memory RAM connect so each CPU has three uh, three channels three on the left three on the right so six channels total to memory channel A, B, C, D, E, F. So CPU one has, as depicted in this diagram, three channels on the left, three channels on the right. And if you look the, at the physical placement, they also get really physically placed on, on the left and the right. Similarly, CPU two will also have three channels on the left and three channels on the right. So a total on the top is six channels. And if you're using CPU two, you have six more channels. Now in each channel, you can also put two, two memory modules, two, two DDR memory modules. So A can have an A0 and a, A1, B will have B0, B1. They will still be on the same access path of the channel, but you could put two, you could fill those two slots for each channel. So you, depending on the memory modules you use, you can use 16 gig, 32 gig, 64 gig, 128 gigs, and you get 12 DIMMs per socket that you could use. So 12 times 12 in this, uh, 12 plus 12 in this case is 24 for both the processors. And that's how you load the, the memory in there. Now, exactly the way we talked about NUMA, the memory is CPU bound and the way you access the other CPUs memory will be to go through that uh, CPU interconnect, the UPI interconnect. Here's a command that I ran just to understand, okay, so what's behind the CPU that I'm running? Now it's not exactly that system, but close to that. And I could see from, by doing an LS CPU command, I could see, okay, I'm on NUMA node one uh, in the VM. And uh, there are, there is one, uh, so one thread per core. And I'm not very sure about what that tells me if it's truly one thread per core or just one thread per core allocated to me and one core that I have here. So CPU megahertz is the speed that the CPU clock rate goes at. This one is 2294. Uh, the L1 data cache in the bottom, L1D cache is 32K, L1 instruction cache is 32K. The L2 cache here is four megs, 4096K. And the L3 cache is 16 megs. Uh, now, uh, the in, in this scenario, the numbers of the cache are different than the 8180 that I talked about. And this is because the CPU that is in this system is an older version. And this goes with the Haswell, as you can see in the model name. And after Haswell, Intel has a new architecture for Skylake for the Xeons. Uh, 
So, but, but NLS CPU is a good command you can run and just see what's running behind your system. What kind of CPU are you running? What kind of caching do you have? You could also do a cat slash proc slash CPU info and you can get some of this information through that command as well or, or maybe additional information. Now that we got the CPU memory figured, there's one more important thing and that is how does a CPU talk to uh, all the other devices? Uh, and that happens uh, through the uh, through the bus system bus and and the standard for interconnecting with that is through the PCIe PCIe Express standard uh, and and it has various versions three there's four five and the higher you go these have been optimized for better speed and performance so the CPU will connect through to to the to the bus through the PCIe so say in this case a PCIe 3 which gives you 8 giga transfers a second and giga transfer is is just to indicate how many transfers you get it's gigabits per second but the useful bits that for the data not the additional bits for parity checking and all so you get 8 giga transfers per second and the CPU connects through this PCIe output to all the other devices now the PCI provides a serial interface and the way you specify a PCI is through the number of lanes. Each, lanes, the, each lane in the PCI interface has separate receive and send ports. So you receive on separate ports and then you send the data on separate ports per lane. Uh, if you need more throughput, the way you uh, get more throughput from PCI is just by using more lanes. So on the servers, a 16 lane PCI is is a standard and, and available, it doesn't have to be, but a 16 lane PCI is pretty much available and you could use that by having slots on the other side by using a one 16 lane uh, card which will use all 16 lanes or you could use two eight lanes or you could use four four lanes or eight two lanes or just 16 one lanes. And the difference will be if you were to combine these lanes together, you get more throughput. They're all serial lanes individually. And if you were to separate them, you get less throughput per lane. Now through this, all the other devices are connected to the CPU through the PCIe uh, ports and the bus that is interconnecting them here. So you could connect uh, the host bus adapters, which connect you to fiber channel. In case of the UCS system here, you could you connect your NIC uh, network interface cards through uh, to to connect to the Ethernet through this same bus. You connect uh, GPU cards for processing, like the NVIDIA GPU cards, through the same interface. Uh, if you have hard disks that uh, use a SAS and SATA interface, you connect a controller to the PCI car, uh, bus that does the change in protocol so you can that controller talks in SAS and SATA to the hard disks uh, but also you have the newer NVMe hard disks which directly connect to the PCI interface and give you much better throughput than the SAS and SATA interfaces that you get from the previous uh, disks now the NVMe disks are just SSDs and they give you pretty fast throughput here is another diagram I found pretty useful to just see how the physical uh, core uh, CPU is laid out for 8180. And you can go to this link and look at details for yourself. Uh, you could see here the cores ni nicely structured. Uh, you can see on the left and the right, I have put those as, as one is the six DDR channels, three on the left, three on the right. This one has three UPI links, uh, that's number two. and you can see two on the top left and there's an one more uh, second from the right uh, and that means when you have three such UPI links uh, you could connect and interconnect and make a four uh, a four CPU system and it'll still be able to talk to the other three CPUs through through dedicated links to those systems it also has three PCIe uh, 16 lane uh, uh, PCIe 16 lane uh, ports so you could uh, because it has three such 16 you could say the total count is 48 lanes that you can connect to this processor uh, 
So that was a set of interesting things to see on the Intel processor and how that processor will connect into a system and finally build you what you where your program runs. Okay.